here. So, hello everyone. I are track two for Modern Pentastrix. You are the right show. Um, I'm Thomas. I'm pretty excited. It's my first time at Area 41, my first time in the rig. So, thank you. Thank you for being here with me. Um, as I said, I'm Thomas Debiz. I'm just an infosec. I used to be an infosec auditor and incident responder. And you can check. I have. I like to push some tools on my GitHub. If you ever try to use my, one of my tools, just say hello. That would be cool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the agenda for today, I will just uh, give you a bit of conte context. My analysis of the last decade uh, for uh, penetration testing and security tools, open source mostly. Um, then we will dig into the, the core and the essence of the, the, this topic and for modern tricks. And taking a step back, that won't be long. So um, what really changed during that decade uh, in, in 2018, uh, it's now possible, it's now easy, easily possible to first scan the entire uh, IPv4 space in minutes slash hours slash days, depending on your connections and, and how much throughput you want to put into. First, with distributed, distributed vulnerable computing, uh, with the census, one of the first uh, whole IPv4 uh, mapping stuff. It was, it's a bit whole, but uh, what, that was the starting of everything. Then you have the asynchronous programming. I'm sure you know ZMAP, mass scan, unicorn scan, to perform large and wide scan on the internet. And then if you are too lazy to perform your own scan, uh, you can request some data from third party platforms, such as Shodan, I'm sure you know Shodan, Zumai. Who in this room ever heard about Zumai? Ah, not, not that much. Uh, Zumai is the Chinese Shodan. Less restriction, I don't even know if they have a paid plan and good data, good, good data quality on this. You have scans.io giving, giving you a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, whole uh, IPv4 uh, uh, scans from different providers, different universities, different projects. Then you also have the census.io, which is a um, private, uh, private owned stuff giving access to some uh, data set, use data set. Then, uh, now you can easily query all those information you want offline, building your own platform. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard about this talk, but it was shown uh, last year at Bissas Las Vegas. It was really awesome. Uh, just to uh, someone, Fadom6, just describing how he, he built an entire uh, OSINT platform for free with open source stuff and on your own, on your own uh, hardware. Then, uh, if you, uh, if you, if off the offline aspect is not that important for you, you can still request some online stuff with the, first with the Recon NG, uh, program. Who in this room ever heard or used about Recon NG? Right. This is an awesome tool, really, uh, to query a lot of different sources for OSINT information, carto cartography data, um, credentials, locations. It, it queries, it has modules for everything. Uh, you have the domain tools. Domain tools is a pr pretty famous third party paid platform. Uh, it's not that cheap, but good quality data and one of the oldest platform for this kind of usage. Pass bin, which is a <laughs> true source of information for everything again. Certificate transparency, giving you a lot of insight about a company or a project, um, certificates, host names, vi virtual host, and so on. And then, uh, now it's easy to pull large windows corporate infrastructures with awesome tools. And some people showed and talked about some tools just before for red, red, red team from the trenches talk and so. So you have Power View, Bloodhound. Uh, you have Crack Map Exec, an awesome tool. Responder also for my in the middle stuff. Post exploitation, Mimikat by a French guy. Uh, did I say I, I, I'm French? So just a warning. Uh, please excuse my bad English. I'm French. Um, invoke Mimikat, which is the still see version and PowerShell version of Mimikat. Empire and its agents, or everything inside one tool, uh, Destar. So the, the landscape totally changed during that decade, and what, what was quite impossible to imagine before, it's now feasible, and you have to, f you have to do it. And that's the next slide. Um, why do you need to adapt your, and why did you, do you need to adapt your techniques, your current techniques, what you already and always used? Because more and more security folks are writing more tools. Because more and more security folks, again, are writing good quality <laughs> software, which is quite new, to be frank. If you remember Netcat, the first version of Netcat, uh, NCAT, sorry, not Netcat, which is the modern replum, replantation of Net, uh, NCAT, but NCAT, 
for years had a buffer overflow vulnerability inside, and every every attacker used this. Now, good quality software is the key, uh, because you will be asked as practitioner, security practitioner, is your uh, penetration tester, incident responder. You will be asked to cover wide and wide scopes. And because, to be frank, it already has changed. Uh, current penetration testers are already asked to scale. Uh, just from what I know and from my personal stuff, a few months ago, I was asked to perform some penetration tests on a, on a large uh, Windows domain having like hundreds, uh, hundreds of thousands of people, objects, and assets. It was wide and wild. Um, then, so it's, it is, it is right now. You have to change. You have to, to adapt your methods. You cannot stick to your, uh, tiny, tiny domains, tiny uh, uh, Windows domain or, or, or OSINT recognition stuff. You really have to adapt and to, and to scale right now. So the first point to scale is to use uh, a proper uh, uh, data format. So as you know, I don't know if I teach, teach you some this thing, but pen testing involves a lot of iterative work. You scan some stuff, you exploit, you harvest some new data, and you apply it on new and old data. Um, and that's it. That's that's the root, that's the, the wheel, uh, the, our job is, is a wheel, is a, uh, an advancing and a, and a leading wheel, but, uh, that's why you need, uh, to, to process a lot of data every time through, during multiple, multiple phases of an engagement. And you need a, a really good data format. So what comes in mind with, uh, with data format is CSV. CSV is, uh, a simple, uh, format, a common format. Uh, every programming language has its version, um, and just use it. There's a lot of things, and it is a human readable format. So, uh, uh, hello, hello XML, but you're not uh, you're not allowed in this room anymore. Um, and this is a simple format, but there's not uh, there's no standard for CSV. Everyone can produce his own CSV. Doesn't mean anything. CSV It's just stating that you're separating some stuff with another stuff. Um, so you can encode it what, how, however you want. Uh, coding and escaping, please escape whole fields every time to, not to be able uh, to, 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 yeah, to prevent any mistake uh, and to unwanted stuff because at some point you will have some broken stuff because you don't code data and code field inside. So and one last thing, just beware of CSV injection. Uh, it's, it's a true attack and it's a, a common and, and simple stuff to put some people through ex Excel spreadsheet and so but CSV, CSV, and always CSV. I would just, on this slide, show you uh, some common penetration testing and security tools offering CSV output, and even better, trying to process CSV input. First, you have Nmap to CSV that I developed um, just to convert an Nmap output to a CSV. For large, when you have 100 and 100 and 1,000 of targets, you, you cannot really read a, a standard Nmap output you really need a, a, a tabular stuff, uh, like a database stuff. CSV is a database. You will see it just after. Then you have WFuzz, a, re a good replacement for Dearbuster, DRB, and whatever you are, uh, always used. Test SSL, .sh, Bloodhound, to, uh, to find some compromise pass of crack. Recon NG, I talked about it just before. Nikto, which, which is, which was, and still a good uh, web server, or scanner, and fuzzer. Um, and they adapt, the, the tool is quite evolved and it's not the same script as uh, 10 years ago. Um, and finally, Nessus. It's really useful when you perform a large vulnerability scan, not for red team stuff, because when you're red team some stuff, you don't use Nessus. But when you're on the compliance and the defensive side, you use Nessus and you need a good uh, view of your asset vulnerability. Shortly, how to handle CSV, because using it is good, having appropriate tools to handle it is better. First, uh, Microsoft Excel, you <laughs> and here, right now, you say, uh, I'm not in this talk just to hear about Microsoft Excel, but Excel is a good, is a good software to process and handle a tiny CSV file with the uh, text to colon, and then you can choose your delimiter here. But the, the, m the main problem with Excel, and this is a current and a common issue, the max number of lines for Excel is one million. This is, this is nothing. This is not big data. One million is like tens of, me uh, you, you take a, an Excel file of 10, 20, 30 megas. It's, it's way more than one million rows. So you cannot open it with Excel. And this is a common on counter issue. Then better. And one of the 
best uh, tool suite you can use for CSV is CSV Kit. So CSV Kit is a suite of common line tools for converting and working with CSV. For input stuff, for the input phase, CSV clean, CSV format, just to correct and ensure you have the proper format inside and how to, you can convert anything to CSV. Processing, so here you will see your common Unix, um, common Unix uh, utilities such so cut, crep, join, sort, stack, but adapt to CSV. So not talking about line, but talking about field right now. So a line has different field and you can have the same process you had for lines before, but for a specific field. That's really, but that's, <laughs> to be frank, that's, that's a bit uh, funny, but it ch quite changed my life a few years ago for engagement. Let's take the CSV grep. The, the things you can see in, in red, I think the, the thing I, I, I use the most, but every utility is really awesome in this suite. CSV grep, you can have the grep, but just for one column, uh, and except of, of piping your um, hold, uh, and hold fashion way to process data, so hook, set, cut, grep, and whatever. With grep, you can do CSV grep, you can do a, a grep, but for, for a, a specific field, join. Join is really awesome, CSV join. Execute a C SQL like join to merge CSV file on the specified columns. And oh, there's a typo here. <laughs> it's on a specified column or column. There, oh no, this is not a typo. You can, you can perform a, a, a true SQL uh, query. Your CSV is a database and you can treat it as a database and perform whatever SQL and SQL treatment uh, processing you want. This is really awesome. It, it doesn't look like, but it is. Um, CSV sort, CSV stack, and for the output, CSV SQL, perform a, a standard SQL. For join, you can join multiple CSV files. For CSV SQL, you just can perform any SQL request you want. CSV stat, we'll just, uh, I will just sh show it to you just after. It's really awesome to have some statistic per field. Um, how to install it? It's really easy. People install CSV kit, nothing else. Uh, so demo time. So in this, I have a lot of demos uh, for this presentation. The first I want to show you is how you can have some cool information without touching anything. So in the folder I am, I hope everyone can see. Uh, I do have. Oh, let me check. I just have two uh, CSV files. One is uh, quite tiny, and the other one is a bit bigger, but nothing, uh, nothing really interesting. Inside, there's, this is only an Asus output filter and an MS, uh, Microsoft KB, and Microsoft unpatched stuff. So without touching anything, if you, if you use uh, CSV stat, I hope we'll uh, be able to see a lot, uh, a lot of stuff, but I'm just using it without touching even the CSV, and I will have some statistic per field. So none of the statistics are relevant. Uh, and the last, the, the, the end, the bottom stuff is really not interesting. But first, so you're in your Nessus output, you have different columns. The first is plugin ID. Uh, here, if you want to perform some mathematical stuff, you, you have, um, you have the most common stuff. You can see this is interpreted as a mathematical and numerical value, but this is a plugin ID. So if you know the plugin ID by, by heart, you can, yeah, you can see that you have a lot of, a uh, lot of this one. I don't know which plugin it is, to be frank. CV again, you can quickly see that you have a cool CVs, uh, at least five times in, uh, five times in, in the, in the data set. Here, uh, CVSS, I don't care. Risk, high critical. Yeah, the famous <laughs> Nasus rating. Host, uh, this is, uh, you can see that this one has a lot of vulnerability. So this is a good target for your, for your uh, engagement. Protocol, okay. Port name. And here, name. Most common values, you can see uh, more, more than 80 times you have this vulnerability. So, okay, this is quite interesting. Uh, now, just filter because you, 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 you do have the column you want to filter in, uh, on, sorry. Um, I will just use, so CSV stat, you can select the, co the column you want just to see uh, what does it look like and to give you uh, proper stuff. So what will it say? Um, here you can filter a bit, so you have only the, the expected column you want. And OK, this is a better view and not to be spammed on the terminal. Right now, I'll be using another command, which is way more interesting than everything I showed you before. So I will be issuing a SQL query on my CSV uh, Nessus output. Um, I, will have, I want the host the name from the, from the report where, where the name looks like something you know, 
I guess. Um, and I will just pipe it to CSV look, which is just a fancy way to, to see a CSV file uh, in a shell. It, it won't be as beautiful as you imagine here, because the sentence from the name is way bigger than the terminal could handle, but on tiny, when you have small values, it's really awesome. So here it process, uh, it process the query, and it, uh, I hope we will have the answer. So it, really, I'm really writing a SQL query on a CSV, or plain, plain flat CSV file. And here, uh, so you can see, I have the host. I, I just wanted to filter for eternal blue stuff. And here, I, I, I really have the list of hosts relevant to my search. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? Just in a plain file, it changed my life. And here you have, so it's, again, uh, every time the same IP, because it's, I don't know why, there's um, duplicates in that file. I just anonymized the IP. This is true data. I just anonymized the IP on the line engagement. So um, this is it for uh, CSV, uh, the screenshot just in case the demo didn't work, I don't care. Then uh, another tool that changed my life recently is Dataiku. Who in this room ever heard the use uses currently Dataiku? No one. Okay, perfect. Dataiku is a data science tool, nothing related to security, nothing related to pen test or so on. And it, it, to be frank, in one word, it's Excel without the Excel limitations. To be to be clear, uh, it is a web web stuff. This is not free, but this is uh, this is there's a free edition, but this is not open source. They do have a, a paid version and a professional license, but the free edition does everything you want and you ever dreamed up of. So it is very intuitive. I will just show show you after this. To be frank, on the it took me four hours on a four course plus uh, se uh, 16 gig uh, RAM machine to join the hash column of a 30 gigs uncompressed DB file, let's say Dropbox or LinkedIn or Dropbox leaks or whatever, with a, another file containing 4 gigs of hash column clear text password. And it only 4 hours with your hook, set, grep, whatever, you cannot reach this and you cannot even do the same processing. So you would have to to cause something, I don't know, maybe input the data in a, in a common database, I don't know, but with that IQ it's really simple, you just upload your CSV, you do some processing visually, even codes when you want to, and it does everything for you. Uh, there are some cool tutorials on, on, their, on their site just to comprehend the, 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 the concept. So what does it look like? Is This is this, so first you start, where is my mouse? Um, you have some, um, some projects. So here I have a Dropbox, Dropbox Leap project. This is not GDPR compliant at all. Uh, you can check G GDPR on the bullshit bingo if you want to. Um, for modern plant tricks, let's go back to the uh, data set I have. A data set is a CSV file, to be frank, when you work with CSV. And here you can filter everything you want. So I just put a filter here on name. Let's let's say I just I, I want all the um, all the data related to this uh, to this uh, vulnerability, so it will filter graphically, and you can perform a lot of stuff with this. You can draw some charts. Let's try. I haven't tried this <laughs> before. Ah, yes, I tried before. So here I'm displaying the count of records associated with the vulnerability name. So the name the name according to Nasus, and here I do have some cool graphs. So you're, for reporting, this is really awesome. I was using it for large engagement. And this is really, really cool. So you have cool graph here, uh, a plain and stupid histogram, but you can have pies and whatever you want. This is, this is awesome. Just from CSV and your common uh, tool, what, what's uh, uh, the output of your common tool, I mean? So you can have a lot of information. Dataiku is really awesome. This is, <laughs> this is my last word on Dataiku. Try it, really. Then parallel execution, another trick, I hope uh, I'm not uh, uh, <laughs> bullshitting you, but um, pen testing involves a lot of parallel work. You extract the result from a tool or from a process or from a phase, you launch a brute force on multiple targets and you repeat every time, every time. Being able to launch simultaneous stuff during your engagement is very important. Time is money uh, and time could be a good security runs and it could be an advantage for the red team compared to the blue team. So I don't like when my uh, HTOP gives this, gives this, and that's why I'm using uh, 
GNU Parallel. Who in this room ever heard or, or is using GNU Parallel? Oh, some, some hand, but not that much again. So Parallel, GNU Parallel is a Perl script. Perl, oh, but uh, it's, it's really awesome. To parallelize any command you want in your shell, it's a drop-in replacement of exargs. I'm, I'm sure you know exargs, but it's on steroids, to be frank. There's a way, lot more option than exarch. So first, you have a progress bar, the two, the two first. You have a job log to, to, give, to have a track of what you're, be, uh, what you're being uh, executing. Uh, a resume, to be able to resume where you left. This is a cool stuff, really, that every time it's missing when you perform some, some stuff, some, some, uh, some brute force or whatever, you want to stop, you have to stop, and you, have, you want to start, to start over from the, the point you, you, you ended. And then you also have the ECCH login when you want to distribute the task on remote computers. This is awesome again. GNU Parallel, and most of the time, my H, when I'm doing some stuff, some penetration test, my HTOP looks more like this, and I'm happy, really, because my machine really uh, is not paid and I'm not bur uh, burning some energy just to do nothing and to have idle stuff. So use GNU Parallel as much as possible. A quick example here, uh, I'm combining parallel and WFAS for when you have to enumerate URL on one, on one server, one website. Yeah, you can use their booster, GRB, and so on. But when you want, uh, how, how, how would you do when you have to perform a URL brute force or hundreds, thousands of sites simultaneously? Just use parallel. So here you give your target list with your correct protocol and pro correct uh, yeah, uh, uh, scheme here, port and whatever. Job log, progress, bar, just for visual fanciness, and this is really awesome. A WFuzz command, uh, here I'm automating a lot of stuff. Here, I, I'm, this is my input. I cannot write here in the, this, input, this output, I cannot write any batch shards in the fine names, at least in, on Unix. Um, so I'm giving a sed slash Perl expression to remove on the fly uh, bad characters. I filter on the code I want. This is, I will just, this is, this kind of option, just say a recursive th th for three level, but uh, deep. Uh, I don't even know, remember Z and C, I'm using every time this. Uh, I'm giving, <laughs> I'm giving uh, um, uh, my word list, and here I'm saying, I'm replacing this entry with one. And here fuzz for W fuzz. And then, when I want to automate really everything, when it when it's ends, when it ends, I just can pa parallel uh, cat GQ said some stuff to have uh, uh, um, uh, by filtering on the uh, 200 code. Even if I filter it, even if I filter for uh, way more code before, here I'm just filtering for the 200 because I just want to quickly perform responding uh, a screenshot of responding URL with web screenshot. Here, this file is ready to be uh, used uh, by Beret Screenshot, which is a tool I used and I developed to text rep uh, quickly and efficiently screenshots of URL. So here, by combining everything, really your, your outputting and your uh, throwing most of your repetitive and uh, yeah, cumbersome work to uh, almost a robot. Then, uh, another example for DNS enumeration, so you can Compare. Uh, we will compare dig plus parallel to another solution just just after. But here you can also par uh, perform an enumeration for domains with parallel, giving some subdomains. Yeah, uh, which uh, with a uh, random, not a random, but uh, my my D my subdomain .txt file looks like this, and I have this number of entries. I'm performing a dig null non answer just to have a, a tiny view. I don't. Ah, yeah, I could remove progress bar because it's, uh, it spams the, the, uh, the shell. And really, how this method, this apparently cheap method, compared against a proper and optimized tool? So yesterday I tried with GoBuster. GoBuster is a, a software with written in Go for DNS and URL enumeration. So written in Go means uh, performance, native, native compilation. So you, you expect more performance and high performance from a Go program with multi-thread and so. So how does it compare with just a simple parallel and dig stuff? Um, for by enumerating these entries for Google.com on the hotel extra Wi-Fi, it takes me 20, 22 seconds, and with parallel plus dig, it takes me 27 seconds. That's 20 percent more. But even it's not that that uh, it's it's not that painful because most of the time when you are on, on the target, you don't. You don't have your tool on it, and you can only install some parallel or dig. 
This is a, a cheap but effective way, and to be frank, not not uh, uh, there's no much overhead for this method. So uh, just yeah, if you compare for this, this is not bad. This is my conclusion for this slide. So parallel plus whatever you want does a good job and is really performant. Then uh, third third trick uh, sometimes. You have to reverse some custom what the fuck uh, obfuscation or encryption scheme design in whatever application you are auditing. Uh, this is especially true for Android and Java. I don't like Java. Yes, uh, this is <laughs> this is lame, low, and slow. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it affects any technology. People do not understand crypto, so you can find you you can be able to reverse any custom what the fuck stuff in any language lang any language you can find. But still, this is really useful and really often encountered during Android application engagements. Sometimes you don't want to go down the rabbit hole to figure out how it works. Sometimes you you don't have uh, you don't have the time. You cannot replicate what you see inside a custom what the fuck inscription to your preferred language for static analysis, for example. For example, Oracle Oracle WebLogic server um, encrypts local password with a specific schemes which at the time, and I still currently, there's no Python module, there's no Python library, no Python crypto module uh, supporting this because Oracle WebLogic server uses Bouncy Castle in Java, having at having, uh, that time this scheme implemented in Bouncy Castle, but you don't have the, the, sim the similar stuff for Python, so you really need to use a, a high-level scripting language using um, of the land, uh, living of the land is a, is, a, is a popular expression right now, but you have to live of the land and to use, uh, to, to stick to the original and, and native code, native application. So when you do some Android and Java application engagements, use Jiten. Who in this room knows Jiten? Oh, cool. Way more, more hand raised. Um, so J what is Jiten for the other? Jiten is something you write with Java code. Uh, which uses Java classes, but with Python library and Python syntax. Isn't that awesome? You can write Java stuff because you have to, because the world use, uses Java, uh, but you don't like Java, and you like to write Python simple code. And with Jiten, it is possible to mix and to, to make the both, the bo the both, uh, the both uh, hands meet. For dynamic analysis of everything else, use Frida. Who in this room knows Frida? Oh, again. Quite good. So Friday is even is even better. You write Python, JS, QML, Swift, or .NET code, injecting C++ code in a JS <laughs> engine to instrument assembly, Objective-C or, or Dalvik on Windows, Mac, Linux, Android, and iOS. So for dynamic stuff, this is this is the the thing and the the state of the art uh, tool to use. As a quick example, on the left you have uh, a, a Java. Um, a common Java crypto implementation that you can find in Android application or Java C client stuff or Java server side stuff. So you recognize the word IV parameter spec, secret key spec, cipher, init, do final. This is the Java, the Java way to perform some encryption. If you want to perform it the same way in another language, it won't look like this. And you have different library, different way, different words to use. But in Jiten, so uh, with Python syntax, Python code, and Python code using Java classes. This is, it looks like really the same. It's really easier uh, to write. Um, so you have here, you can have IV parameter spec, secret spec, get instance, I need to final, without the Java, all the Java bullshit, you know. Um, uh, the new stuff, the get bytes, the, the multiple semicolon, I don't know. Um, you don't have anything. Just take the Java code, uh, clean everything, and you have the, your, almost your Java, your Jiten code. Um, as a real life example, so I implemented the Jiten decryptor for WebLogic, as I told you just before, again on my GitHub. Um, I can perform a, a quick demo, just not, <laughs> you, again, to see that I'm not bullshitting you. Um, <laughs> not, not that much. Uh, here, I have a tiny Jiten script. So, doing like a common Java, Java encryption stuff. So, I'm importing Java crypto, import everything. You know, all the Java, the Java, this is the Java library. This is not Python, Python stuff. I can write here another line, importing some Python stuff. It will work. A Python library, and you can mix, the, you can mix both. This is the, the true, um, the true awesomeness of Jiten. Here you have the IV key, S key. I just want to decrypt here, uh, 
something. I want to. I want to encrypt. Sorry, I want to encrypt your swag with uh, a key in AES with a PKCS five padding, which is pretty common. But I, ch I could use any any crypto stuff from Java here uh, instead, and I'm just ex printing and displaying it in Python two. Sorry, sorry, Python three guys. I like you, but <laughs> it's this script is Python two. Um, here, without the Java bullshit, you can encode hex. Uh, you ha you do have some two string stuff. This is some. Reminiscence from from the Java stuff in Jiton, but that's not that much to pay <laughs> to use to use it. So let's just execute that script. You know, are you convinced that this script is pretty easy to write, pretty simple, and there's no tricks and no much no much uh, uh, caveat and no much thing to no much trap to fall into. And if I just execute it, to be frank, it should work. <laughs> so this is. Compiling uh, your script in Java bytecode, you don't see it, and it executes. This. So here, I'm just executing like a, P a Python script, a Python style script using Java classes with Java crypto and Java methods. Is that okay for you? Is that clear? Are you convinced this is good? Again, Jayton changed <laughs> again my life during last engagement. No, this is not this. Last trick, um, last trick, but not least, um, the last one is. Being able to compile Python script on the fly. So most of the time, in in real life engagements, um, you need to have the, a compiled version of a tool. Why? Because the target you're on to doesn't have the proper execution environment. You cannot set up it. You're too lazy. You don't have internet access. You're on no route. Any reason? You just need a fucking program to be compiled and just to execute on a, on a single target that doesn't require any pre specific privileges. You can. You don't have any proper reverse shell on Mitchell-Preter, uh, and you need, or, or you need to evade antivirus, so compiling on the fly for yourself the tools maybe could evade and could bypass antivirus. So compile, compile Python script with PyInstaller, who, again, who uh, uses, heard uh, PyInstaller just before? Before I, oh, some, some, some ends, not that much, but some. So what is PyInstaller? PyInstaller is bundles a Python script, everything you want, with a Python interpreter in one executable if you want to, but it merges everything uh, and it gives you a native native build. To install it on Windows, you can compile everything on everything. This is again the same, but on Windows, first install one Visual C++ compiler. If you have Visual Studio on your Windows laptop, you already have this dependency uh, uh, need. And then pip install pinstaller, nothing else. And you can even cross compile. So imagine, so here with this method, you compile on Windows, you compile a Python script on Windows for a uh, Windows target. But you can, some French guy uh, uh, even tried, I never used, I never tried before, but I think it works. It, it really works for at least simple script. You can even cross compile. So let's say um, you want to compile a Python script from your Linux to a Windows target, you can do it with Wine. Wine plus P installer. This is awesome again. The most useful option, option of P installer is one file. So you have really one standalone file. Everything is packed inside one executable. This is great. One dir, one dir is, is useful when one executable is way, way too big. By way too big, I mean more than 15, 16 megs because it takes a lot of time to unpack. Because one file, what is one file? One file is a self extracting zip payload. So if you have a lot of resources, it can take time really to execute. Um, you have one interesting key for uh, antivirus bypass is key. Uh, by default, there's no encryption for the for the standalone executable file. With key, you can provide a specific key, and um, it will encrypt the payload. But the key is inside the executable. There's no obfuscation, and so it just it just gives you an obfuscated version and encrypted version. Uh, of your executable, and you can easily bypass antivirus with this. Really, an icon when you want, when you want a specific icon for visual fanciness. Really, the the, um, the 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 command to input is ready. You'll see just after. Um, uh, I think the demo is after. Okay, I will just show you the complete command. This is really uh, really simple. So right now, if I want to convince you, I want I have to show you some real life example of Python script compiling native executable, mostly for Windows, for, for most of the uh, of the tool I will show you. Do you know Impacket? Do you know Impacket examples? Who in this room, or uh, usually 
uses in packet example w, WMI exec, PS exec dot Python, and so. These are really cool stuff, mostly used during Red Team or Windows engagement, Windows pen testing. So here, uh, you compile all this awesome utility inside one executable that can perform here. You can see w, WMI exec dot exe. You can provide the hashes and so. It's getting a, a big popularity right now. So again, it, I compiled the, the version. Most of these tools are right now flagged by antivirus, but if you remember the key tricks, just, just take the, the Python file, specify a, your own key, and it will bypass antivirus. In the impacket example tool suite, you have, uh, you have all, all of this utility. Uh, the most famous one you can find is mimikatz.exe, ntlmrelay.exe, psexec.exe, Summer dump just to, tap, to, to dump uh, some, uh, some database, uh, some hive uh, remotely. Uh, secrets dump to process an NTDS file. So if you, this is a, a real life trick that I use a lot of time, every time. When you cannot grab the NTDS database from a domain because of the network connection, because you don't have space on your own computer, it happens a lot. Um, just take that executable and put it on the domain controller on wherever you want, but and it will, you will be able to process the NTDL file, you know, remotely, offshore. Just offshore the extraction, just grab the, the tiny, the tiny log, uh, the tiny uh, hashes, and it way, way lay spaces that grabbing the whole NTDS file. SMB exec, to execute some stuff over SMB. SMB relay, uh, ticketer, to, to create in two arguments, two options, golden and silver tickets. WMA exec, just which is way stealthier than SMB exec, WMI persist, WMI query, and in one executable each time. This is really awesome. Again, then, you, do you know Patator? Patator is a multipurpose brute forcer. You can see here how many protocol and stuff you can brute force inside one tool. So again, this is a Python script. I compiled it for Windows, and the challenge here, I was really hoping for the worst. The best came. Uh, so. It depends on, on a lot of third-party modules because when you want, you need some libraries to, to brute force FTP, SSH, SMTP, uh, AG, uh, AGP, Oracle, and so on. So you depend on a lot of third-party modules, which <laughs> these dependencies have their own dependencies. So at the end, you have all this dependency, and you don't think that everything will be n packed neatly into one executable. And guess what? P installer managed to put everything inside one executable. So basically, with pythator.exe on my GitHub, um, you, have, you can brute force all this protocol with only one executable, one standalone file, which is, as I said, a bit big uh, for the pinstaller paradigm. It's like 18, 80, 18 megs, and it takes, like in my lap, crappy laptop, it can take like one minute between uh, launching the command and having, having it properly executing the things you want. So. One, the one year option can be useful if you want not a one executable, but one directory, but that you can move the same on the target, and it will be faster. But so everything is packed inside that great utility. Again, a crack map exec. Um, I, <laughs> I don't know if I can officially say this, but I'm the unofficial official maintainer of the version two compiled version. Uh, which is yeah, uh, way, old, um, way older than the current one, which is version 3 with a lot of modules option, but still, <laughs> my, my version is UTF-8 compatible, so uh, when you're not an American guy, you can, with this you can pen test <laughs> French, French uh, companies and uh, other countries where you can have some accent and some, some UTF-8 needs. So it compiles and it's pretty used. To be frank, when I was when I was doing uh, preparing that presentation, I I, uh, I made some research and I found that I found a, a report from the uh, British National Security um, Agency uh, reporting that this tool, my tool, has been used in real life attack on industrial system. I don't know if I'm proud of it, but I think it it should convince you that it works in real life. This compilation. <laughs> I'm not that proud, but I found that it was really used in a real-life attack. 
Then you have, G again, another example, GD GDWP Chelifier for the Java Debug Wire protocol. Again, in one, one, one binary stuff, this is pretty awesome. So some demos. So I won't compile this because it's already compiled. So I will just show, show you, again, a real-life example. A few, few months, a few weeks ago, I was looking uh, for a way to easily have some tunnels, uh, dynamic tunnels without the SSH, and I found uh, a cool tool named ArtPivot, um, name but someone very famous whose nickname is ArtCon, something like this, pretty famous, um, and doing really the job with a simple, uh, simple two utility server that Python uh, and uh, client of Python, you have dynamic tunnel end to end. You just need Python on the target and on your machine, on your machine that won't be a problem. On your on the target that shouldn't be a problem if you're attacking a, a Linux stuff. But if you're attacking a Windows stuff, few changes, few chan chan chances, sorry, <laughs> that uh, there's a Python version, a Python interpreter installed. So you, in that case, I wanted and I needed a, a single executable having that cool and awesome program allowing me to have some tunnels. So what did I do? P installer, more, more, uh, clean, just to clean some cache, one file. Uh, Server.python, it will compile, <laughs> hopefully. Um, it will compile this time. It will compile just for the. Um, I'm showing you the um, the Linux uh, from Linux to Linux, but it works the same, exactly the same on Windows to Windows. I just don't have the the Visual C++ installer installed on my uh, machine. Maybe I have. I don't even remember. But I'm using just Linux just to show you this. And at the end, you will see a proper and real native binary executable. So apparently, it compiled successfully. I just just show, I can show you. Let me. Let me clear a bit. Uh, it is in the dist folder, server. So you can see that it looks like a, a, a native uh, binary. And when you execute it, it should work. This is, this is the, the plain, the same version, just let me show you, than the, the Python version. This is exactly, exactly the same, but this time you have it compiled in one executable. So if you want to drop it on a remote target, it works. And you don't need any environment for this. So um, there's maybe a, a last trick I wanted to show you. I haven't documented it, but uh, in the f next version of my talk, uh, you, you can already dig. It's something. Uh, the next trick I would like to formalize is stop using grep. Grep is dead. Just use another alternative when you are doing some code, code search. There are some some cool tools. There are the, uh, multiple tools uh, achieving and trying to to solve the code searching, the, the pattern searching stuff inside code, structural code. You have different utility native native tools which are named Sift. You have Sift, Rip Grip, and the Silver Searcher. The the three uh, those three tools are really awesome and and you have better performances and way more options than Grep. For instance, something really used by the developer is uh, if you want to ignore and to uh, honor the git, git ignore file, if you are looking and searching through codes, um, you have some, some reason just to avoid some specific files that you document in your git ignore. And with this, you can honor and take into account the git ignore file. Something with grep, grep is not meant for this. Grep is older than git and there haven't been any any improvement just to honor this. This is just a tiny example, but really you have better performances. And I don't remember it right now, but either it's Sift, RibGrep, or the Silver Searcher. One of uh, one of uh, these three um, uh, utility is the utility you can have in Visual Studio when you perform a search function. This is the, to to show you that this is really used and really useful for code searching. Let's go back to uh, the presentation. So uh, with all these tricks, my final <laughs> message is CSV kit all the things, that I call the things, GNU parallel all the things, Jiton all the things, free all the things, and pinstall everything. Thank you.
Okay, are there any questions? Everything was clear to you? Are you pretty happy to know and will you p apply these techniques in your, in your work, in your day-to-day -day job? I hope, I hope yes. Okay, it doesn't look like it, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.